in a quiet English village. A few hours drive from London, a threat was delivered to a local farmer. Impaled on a fence post, a severed lamb's head, along with the message, you next. The note said little about its author, but between the lines, it said plenty. Nestled among the lush rolling hills of England's west country is the tiny village of Horton, a cluster of houses lining one main street, a farming community where life is simple, quiet, and peaceful. But in the spring of 1984, the peace and quiet were shattered following a series of bizarre events that took place here at Widden Hill Farm. 44-year-old Graham Backhouse and his wife Margaret lived at the farm with their two children. Backhouse had inherited the farm from his father, but by all accounts, Backhouse, a former hairdresser, was not having financial success as a farmer. He had to take over the, the farm. He had no option in the business. Uh, and he, there was a pretty obvious that he was a kind of reluctant, grudging farmer. But it was well known that uh, the farm was not making money. On March 30th, 1984, Backhouse reported a grisly and terrifying discovery. A severed lamb's head had been impaled on his fence post, placed next to it a note warning in large handwritten letters, you next. Backhouse told police that this wasn't the first time threats had been made against him. He told me that he was receiving um, telephone calls of a threatening nature, um, even threats to kill, as I recall. Backhouse also told police about a threatening letter he had received in the mail. Which said, words to the effect, um, you have ruined my sister's life, um, I'm going to get you, you bastard. Less than two weeks later, the threats turned violent. Margaret Backhouse was heading into town to do some shopping. She decided to take her husband's car because her car was having some mechanical difficulties. Graham was in the barn and never heard the explosion or Margaret's screams for help over the music from his radio. The bomb was unsophisticated, but extremely powerful. It had been planted directly under the driver's seat. Strictly speaking, it wasn't a bomb. It was a shortened version of a shotgun. It was constructed from a galvanized steel pipe, two inch diameter, quite a thick wall to the pipe. Margaret Backhouse survived the explosion because the force of the bomb was directed downwards by the high quality construction of the driver's seat. But doctors still had to remove more than a pound of pellets and shrapnel from Margaret Backhouse's body. The bombing stunned villagers who now had to accept the fact that the threats against Graham Backhouse were serious. When bombs go off, you've got to take it seriously. And people were thinking that there must be something behind this. It was the only possible conclusion that, that we all reached, that the bomb must have been for Graham Backhouse. But who wanted Graham Backhouse dead? And why? On the same day of the car bomb explosion which seriously injured Margaret Backhouse, a threatening letter was delivered to the Backhouse farm. And the message said something to the effect, came twice last week, that the pigs were about. The note ended with the words, see you soon. The words twice and were had both been misspelled, and experts believed that the spelling errors were deliberate. 
Investigators also examined the note found beside the severed lamb's head, the one which stated, you next. An analysis of that note revealed a possible clue, an impression from a circular doodle. When a doodle is made on a piece of paper, the pressure from the writing instrument leaves an impression on the pages underneath the original doodle. Doodle impressions can be found using a technique called oblique lighting, which casts shadows across the indentations of the paper. So that you can see the impression as a row of shadows, and these can then be photographed. Police asked Graham Backhouse to identify all individuals who may have wanted to harm him. He was interviewed at some length about who his enemies were, uh, who his ex-girlfriends were, and things of that nature. Backhouse told police about one possibility. A former quarry worker named David Hodkinson. Backhouse said he once had a sexual affair with Hodkinson's wife. Hodkinson would have had access to explosives and was also an electrician who specialized in wiring automobiles. On the day the uh, explosion took place, this person was in fact um, out of the country on holiday and had been out of the country for uh, three or four days beforehand. When Hodkinson's alibi checked out, police turned their attention to one of Graham Backhouse's neighbors, Colin Bedale Taylor. He was a retired engineer, seriously depressed over the death of his 19-year-old son, Digby, who died in a car crash two years earlier. Bedale Taylor and Backhouse were involved in a bitter land dispute which they couldn't seem to resolve. They lived 200 yards apart. Colin Bedale Taylor was well-liked in the small farming community. He was a woodworker and handyman who built this bench for his friends in the village with the words, Bide a while, inscribed on the backrest. Despite the differences between Backhouse and Bedale Taylor, police did not seriously consider him a suspect in the car bombing. There was no reason to suspect that Mr. Bedale Taylor was in any way, shape, or form involved in this incident. With no other leads, Backhouse and his family were given 24-hour police protection immediately following the bombing. After a week, Graham Backhouse began to resent the police intrusion and asked them to end the around-the-clock protection. Before they left, police installed an alarm button connecting the Backhouse home directly to the police station. Just two weeks later, the alarm sounded. The police cars began streaming up the hill. We knew that something was seriously wrong. When the police arrived at the farm, they saw a horrific scene of blood and death. Blood was found on the kitchen floor. The chairs had been overturned. And at the bottom of the stairs, at the end of a hallway, lay the body of Colin Bedale Taylor, Backhouse's neighbor. He had been shot twice in the chest. In his right hand, firmly clutched, was a Stanley knife inscribed with his own initials, CBT. Backhouse was bleeding profusely with gaping slash wounds on his face and chest. Well, let's pop in to see how your wife is faring. She's doing very well. He told police that Bedale well, Taylor stopped God by to ask how his wife was doing in the hospital following the car bombing. Justice? Without warning, <laughs> Colin flew into a rage and attacked Backhouse with a Stanley knife. It's me that set the bomb in your car. You should have been the victim, not her! He said he was doing God's work, blamed Backhouse for the death of his son, and admitted planting the car bomb. Backhouse ran to the hallway, grabbed his shotgun, and shot Bedale Taylor in self-defense. Police roped off the farm and called for forensic detectives to conduct an examination. They were particularly interested in the blood trails, the one they could see and the one they couldn't find. Graham Backhouse told police that he killed Colin Bedale Taylor in self-defense after his neighbor went berserk and attacked Backhouse with a Stanley knife. 
Backhouse said his neighbor admitted planting the car bomb and that it was intended for him, not his wife. When police searched Bedell Taylor's property, they found evidence linking him to the bombing. We found a long section of pipe on grounds quite close to Colin Beadle Taylor's home. And this matched the remnants of the bomb that were reconstructed. The obvious implication was that the pipe bomb had been made by him and come from his land. But forensic detectives were confused by what they found at the scene of the attack. First, the blood spatter on the kitchen floor told a story, but it was a story inconsistent with Backhouse's version of events. The staining was predominantly in the form of small, circular drips of blood. The circular drops of blood found on the kitchen floor were not consistent with the struggle, but indicated that the blood dripped from an individual standing still. Blood dripping vertically to a surface during a passive act of bleeding will form circular spots or stains. But if we have a violent movement of the body, the flicking of the hand, see a different shape of stain. They're more elongated, and some of the stains will show a tail shape to them, pointing in the direction of trowel that the blood impacted the surface. And there was something missing. Backhouse said he ran for his life from the kitchen down the hall to get his gun. But police could find no trail of blood. We seem to have a man who was dripping blood profusely in the kitchen, manages to, to move over 15 foot of carpeted hallway without leaving any drips of blood. And police were faced with another discrepancy. Backhouse said he shot the Dale Taylor after his face and chest had been slashed but his blood was not found on the gun. Had he been attacked before firing the gun, blood from his face wound or from his hands would have dripped onto the gun as he fired in self-defense. So both features missing from the gun suggested that he wasn't bleeding and hadn't blood staining on him at the time that he picked up that gun. The victim was found clutching the Stanley knife firmly in his right hand. The forensic pathologist found this highly unusual. When somebody's shot, or when somebody dies, they go limp. Uh, so then I would expect to see the response of the body's response to being shot twice in the chest, and death taking place simply to relax, and the knife would fall from the hand. It wouldn't be cl clutched tightly in the hand. And Bedale Taylor's right palm was bloody. When an individual holds a knife during an attack, the knife usually prevents blood from staining the entire palm. There's an area of the palm which is either very lightly stained with blood or not stained with blood. Um, the knife protects that part of the palm. Backhouse's chest wound was also inconsistent with the struggle. Because normally if you're cut, you withdraw. Your body jerks away. So how on earth are you going to get a wound which then travels almost half the circumference of the chest? in a one-to-one -one confrontation, I would never expect to see that pattern of injury. And Backhouse had no defensive injuries commonly found when a person fends off a knife attack. They actually grab hold of the weapon itself and they get cuts across the fingers and the palm. And sometimes you find that they've tried to block the weapon, put their hand up, and they get cuts in the back of the forearm or the side of the forearm or on the back of the hand. None of these were present here. And there was something else, something small, but significant. When police searched Backhouse's study, they found a notepad. On one of the pages was a circular doodle. The ink doodle found on Backhouse's notepad was identical to the impression found on the U Next note. It was a whole series of circles, quite a complicated thing. The impressions were quite deep so that you had a good photograph and you were able to get a good alignment and you could see clearly that it came from this doodle. It was exactly the same, there was no doubt whatsoever about it. This is the doodle that we're talking about here. Uh, you can see just various scribble. When we turn the page, I think you can still see the impression this note is now very old and has been well handled so it's not terribly clear now but it is still there 
just see it there. Still see the impression just there. Proof that the U next note was written on Graham Backhouse's own notepad. We now had a document in the form of the U next note that we could positively link with Widdenhill Farm. Police believed they could now piece together the bizarre events which led to the cold-blooded murder of Colin Bedale Taylor. After two straight years of crop failures, Graham Backhouse was 50,000 pounds in debt to a local bank and was in desperate need of funds. Backhouse devised an elaborate scheme to get out of debt once and for all. His plan was to kill his wife and collect on her life insurance policies, which he had recently doubled to 100,000 pounds. But he wanted the murder to appear as if Margaret had been killed by someone out to kill him. So Backhouse fabricated the story about the threatening phone calls and letters. Backhouse himself wrote the U next note and impaled the severed lamb's head on his fence post, establishing the ruse that someone was out to get him. With the stage now set, Backhouse turned his attention to the murder of his wife. He planted a pipe bomb under the driver's seat of his own car. He knew his wife would drive his car into town the next morning because her car was having mechanical problems. But Backhouse never expected his wife to survive the explosion. Desperate and fearing the police would consider him a suspect, Backhouse panicked and decided to set up a scapegoat, someone to divert the police inquiry from himself. The logical choice was his neighbor, Colin Bedale Taylor. I'm fine. Thanks for coming about the furniture. I'm Villagers sorry. knew that the two were involved in a land dispute. When Bedale Taylor accepted Graham's invitation to discuss a piece of furniture, he had no way of knowing he had walked into a death trap. Going. Colin was shot twice in the chest in cold blood. To make the shooting appear to be in self-defense, Backhouse slashed himself in the face and chest with a knife he had inscribed with his neighbor's initials. Bleeding profusely from the self-inflicted wounds, Backhouse overturned kitchen chairs to make it appear there had been a struggle, never realizing the shape of the blood spatter would indicate no struggle at all. Backhouse's own blood was found on the victim's shirt because he stood directly over the body when he placed the knife in the dead man's hand. With the crime scene now complete, Graham Backhouse called the police. Sometime earlier, Backhouse planted a piece of pipe on Bedale Taylor's property, identical to the type used in making the car bomb. When the forensic evidence contradicted Backhouse's version of events, he was arrested for both the attempted murder of his wife and the murder of Colin Bedale Taylor. In addition to the blood spatter evidence, the doodle impression found on Backhouse's notepad and the medical examiner's opinion that the cuts on Graham Backhouse were self-inflicted, another crucial piece of evidence helped seal the case. It came from the letter delivered to the Backhouse farm on the day of the bombing. Forensic detectives wanted to analyze the glued envelope for saliva hoping to determine the blood type of the individual who sent the letter, but they discovered much more. Under the microscope, the fiber found in the envelope matched fibers found in a brown cardigan sweater owned by Graham Backhouse. Further proof that Backhouse had mailed the threatening letter to himself. Graham Backhouse's plotting continued from his prison cell 
he conned a fellow prisoner into smuggling out an unsigned letter to a local newspaper. The letter implicated Colin Bedale Taylor in the car bombing, but the letter was confiscated. And Backhouse's handwriting matched the handwriting on the letter delivered to the farm on the day of the bombing. After a 16-day trial, Graham Backhouse was convicted of all charges against him and received two life sentences. If somebody had set out to write a novel along those lines, it would never have been accepted by anybody. I mean, this is absolutely truth being stranger than fiction. This was an outstanding case in many respects, principally because without forensic evidence, there was no case. The worst aspect was, of course, the fact that he picked on a totally innocent man in the village uh, and killed him for no other reason than to try to remove blame from himself. And that's what made it diabolical murder. <laughs>